salad right. If you were a gladiator in Roman times with a crowd of 50,000 people baying for blood, what would you eat to prepare yourself for the fight? And if you were a medieval knight readying for battle, what would you choose as your final feast? We're going to find out exactly what you need to eat to be fighting fit. Coming up, the gastronauts find out what soldiers have eaten through the ages. What is that? Fish. They try eating like a pirate and get up close with some tiny stowaways. And they simulate dinner in space with a spin on some kit used to train astronauts. You know, in space, nobody can hear you scream. The gastronauts helping me travel through time are... I think gladiators ate spaghetti bolognese because it gives you energy and it'll make you very energetic for you to fight. If I was going into battle, I would eat meat um, and fruit. I think I would be a warrior like um, Boudicca. I'll be a Roman warrior because they're strong and they never give up. If I was going into battle, I'd sugary sweets to get me hyper. I'm dressed like a gladiator. Now I want to eat like one. Each of the gastronauts have come up with a plate of food they think would be perfect gladiator grub. To give their dishes the thumbs up or throw them to the lions, we're joined by classical historian and nutritionist Tonya Buxton. First up into the arena is Katie. So what do we have here? Um, I've got some raw meat, some fruit, some bread and some scorpions. So it's great that you've got the meat because there's protein there, but they would definitely have cooked the meat first. Fruit is good, scorpions are a no-no. That's a shame, I was quite looking forward to that. So that's a thumbs down for Katie, but will Harriet's gladiator diet fare any better? Well, we've got steak, marshmallows and red currant jelly. Steak is good because it's full of protein, so that helps repair the muscles. But the marshmallows, why did you put those in? It's nice for a treat and I like them too. Oh, OK, um... but... Do you know what? Marshmallows have absolutely no nutritional value at all. So, good news in that it would be really tasty. I'd like to eat it, but no, because it wouldn't make me strong. The gastronauts are offering up their ideas for food that was fit for a gladiator, but so far they've been way off the mark. Will Cameron be any closer? It's a really good diet, but I just don't think it's exactly what the gladiators would have eaten at that time. Such a shame! And Maya hasn't quite guessed what a gladiator gorged on either. So what's really missing here is the energy food. There's no carbohydrate here. And so they'd be able to repair their muscles, but they wouldn't have the energy for that long battle ahead of them. Kanye is cleverly going for the Italian job. Surely a gladiator liked a bit of spag bol. You've got the right place, because we're in Italy, in Rome. But I don't think that the Romans would have quite have had spaghetti just yet. It's a bit early to have arrived um, for gladiator times. That's such a shame. I was rooting for you there, mate, but no. I'm not surprised gladiators didn't eat scorpions or marshmallows, but just what did they eat before battling to the death? That's disgusting. It looks like vomit. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it does. It does. This is a kind of gruel. It's got everything that they need to keep them nice and healthy. It's got barley and oats and peas and carrots. Oh. Do you want to try some? Yes. <laughs> wow. How's it been made? How's it been cooked? Well, this has been cooked with a little bit of goat's milk oh. and, and water, <laughs> and it's stewed for a really long time. It tastes like porridge. Yeah, that's right, it does. It tastes a lot like porridge, but a kind of a more savoury style porridge. When you think of porridge, it's, it's a bit sweeter. But this is the sort of food that, that people were given when they went into battle. It was really good for them. And what's really interesting is that foods would develop through things like war. So for soldiers and gladiators, people began to, began to understand a lot more about nutrition. And, and food began to develop and food technology started because you needed people to be really strong. And that was a really big part of history. Uh, no, not nice. <laughs> 
OK, so imagine I've been eating this for a couple of years and I've, I've beaten my opponents in the arena. Now I invite you all to have a great gladiator's feast, OK? Come on. If gladiators weren't hacked to pieces in the arena, they might win their freedom and a meal fit for an emperor. Welcome to my victory feast. As a big relief to all of that gruel, I'm going to give you... ..a suckling pig. This is a spectacular delicacy. It's very, very expensive. It's a very, very delicious food to have, and you'd save it for a big, big occasion like this. So, has anyone had suckling pig before? No, I would like some. Smells oh, good, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Now, back in Roman times, after it had been cooked, they would fill the cavity with lots of little live birds. So when they cut it open, all the live birds would flutter around and, and, uh, and it would be a big, big spectacle. This would be such an expensive dish to have because most people wanted to rear their pigs and get as much meat from them as they possibly could. So to actually roast a suckling pig, would, would only rich families could do that. So if you were the head of the family or you had a special guest, the part that you would offer them was actually the ear because that's a real delicacy in Roman times. Anyone here want to try the ear? Me. Yeah? OK. You wouldn't have thought that the ear would be the best bit, but there you go. It's like normal crackling, but it's, but it's got a different texture to it because when you have another crackling, it's, it's, a, it's a bit more crunchier. It tastes like your everyday crackling. The pig's ear was very crunchy, and I wasn't expecting it to be crunchy because ears are sort of soft. Well, now I think we can truly say that we've eaten like gladiators. Well done, guys. So now we know that gladiators lived on a sort of vegetable porridge and celebrated by eating baby pig's ears. It's even weirder than the dishes the gastronauts thought up. Wealthy Romans liked to show how rich they were by having feasts that lasted for hours and had exotic ingredients. Delicacies included peacock tongues, roast dormice, boiled flamingo, and a dish where a chicken was stuffed inside a duck, which was stuffed inside a goose, which was stuffed inside a pig, which was stuffed inside a cow, and then cooked. We're moving on from the Roman Empire to medieval Britain in our quest to find out what food kept soldiers fighting fit through the ages. Now we're going to see what sort of nosh a knight wolfed down before going jousting. So we've got here plates, this is a, a turkey, and we've got, we've got corn and potatoes and carrots and, and some coffee and tea and things. Do you think this is the sort of uh, the food that they might have eaten in the Dark Ages? No. 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 Well, well, I think they might have eaten some of the things, like they might have eaten the carrots and the potatoes, mm -hmm. but I don't think they would eat peppers and that. If it's called the Dark Ages, this is quite a cheerful meal. It is, isn't it? Yeah. I think they wouldn't eat in this because it's a bit rich and they, they wouldn't have the money to buy this stuff. You're absolutely right. They didn't eat any of these because none of these existed in Britain. Sweet corn, peppers, tomatoes and even potatoes and turkeys were off the menu as they came from the Americas, which hadn't even been discovered by then. Instead, people had to rely on food that could be grown in Britain. What peasants tended to eat was a kind of a broth, a vegetable broth. That looks um, quite nice. It looks, it's very healthy, I think. So, everyone dip in. Tell me what you think. Oh, I think I've had this. It's like soup. It's really nice, really oniony. The peasants, they actually had a relatively healthy diet. I mean, this isn't too bad. Lots of vegetables, um, but they had very, very small portions. Has it got meat in it? Uh, no, there's no meat in it, and that's a really interesting point because meat was seen as something very special, something that, that you had to have money. So, does anyone know what that is? What is that? Fish. Is that a rabbit? Is that a, rab a rabbit or something? Well done, that's exactly what it is. It's a rabbit. Rabbits were widely eaten in medieval times, and the meat is low in fat and high in protein. Although these days, some people feel uncomfortable about eating an animal many think of only as a pet. It's still got its eye. Yeah, that's and its, its tongue. Head. Ew. Best bit of the rabbit is, is the legs. There we go. Dig in. It's quite chewy. Yeah, it tastes it tastes like chicken. Yeah, it does. Oh 
If it's between chicken and duck or cut up, you would say that's chicken. It tastes like chicken by the texture because the texture is like, like a bit stringy. Medieval knights ate a lot of meat and white bread as these were expensive and showed off their wealth. They looked down on cheaper peasant food like wholemeal bread and vegetables and they wouldn't eat them. Now, do you think that this is a good diet for a knight? Mm. Um, no. It's a bit fatty and they should have vegetables and fruit. You're absolutely right. Although the rich people had access, that they thought that the most expensive things should be kept for them, what they really should have been eating was the peasant's diet, and that's the irony of it. They had seasonal food, they had food from the land, very simple vegetables and good, wholesome kind of ingredients, whereas the rich thought that, they, that spending money on food was the best thing to do and actually ended up having a worse diet, too much protein, a lot of fat. Now, I think... The only way we can really work out how a knight managed to eat on the battlefield is to dress like one. When I was young, I never knew. This could be so uncomfortable. Armour may be great for protecting the body from injury, but it's totally useless at almost everything else. <laughs> Wearing armour is like having no knees or elbows, which makes eating really tiresome. Oh! Like Daleks, knights were metal-clad warriors who scared the living daylights out of their enemies. Also like Daleks, they could be defeated by some simple stairs. Knights didn't play football, probably because a game would last three days and would be slower than a dead slug. They didn't bother inventing games consoles either. Just you try beating the end-of-level boss with those gloves on. And if you want to interrupt the slaughter on the battlefield to have a natter with your mates, you'll sound like you're talking with a bucket on your head, which I guess you sort of are. Hello? But the worst design flaw in a suit of armour? It's got no zip. So if you get caught short on the battlefield, your pee has only one place to go. So comparing the medieval knight's diet with that of the gladiators, it seems like in the Dark Ages they forgot all of those advances that, that the Romans made in nutrition and the understanding of what food did to you. So back the gladiators had, had all the really good stuff, the pulses and the porridge. didn't taste very nice. The knights went for the stuff that tasted really good but was useless on the battlefield. We're finding out what fighting men and women have eaten throughout history to get them ready for battle. Now it's time to examine what pirates and the navies who opposed them had for high tea on the high seas. OK, my hearties, take a seat here at my galley. OK, I wonder if you know what pirates had to eat and drink. Meat. Meat. Anything else? Fish. Fish, fish, because you're out, out on, the, on the ocean. It's actually quite difficult to, to fish off a boat in the middle of the high seas. There aren't that... You know, fish tend to, to, to stay around shorelines. But can you drink seawater? No. No, no why not? Because it's, it's, not too salty. Salty. it's not good for you. Too salty, that's right. You, you drink seawater and you actually, uh, you actually get rid of more liquid than you gain. Instead, they took huge barrels of beer and every day they'd have eight pints of beer and half a pint of rum. Just imagine on the rolling seas, if this was rolling about and you were going off to battle and you had eight pints of beer and half a, <laughs> half a pint of rum inside you. It feel sick. Sick. Pirates and sailors had to drink beer instead of water. The alcohol kills off bacteria, so beer can be kept for months without going off, unlike water. What about the food? What they ate a lot of was this. Uh, what is that? It's not raw meat. Can I Do you reckon it? it's salmon? Yeah, have a little smell. This is called salt beef. It's been salted, and when you salt things, you draw all the moisture out of it. But also, a heavy salt environment is another thing that, that bacteria can't grow in. So that was the protein that they had. They also had a lot of this. Ooh, that, that looks like some raw biscuits or something. It looks like Ew. shortbread. It's called hard tack, and it's just a mixture of flour, salt and water. And again, dry things, no moisture in there. Bacteria can't multiply. It can last for years. Who wants to have a try? Yeah? Excellent. Okay, let's start off with a little bit of salt beef. See? It looks like lamb. I don't really like it because I can't bite into it. <laughs> if I were to eat it 24-7, I would, I would have enjoyed it. Get a bit boring after yeah. a while, wouldn't it? Yeah. Why don't we try the hard tack? Yeah, grab one biscuit each. Before you try it, just tap it to see how hard it is. Oh, my days. That is quite hard. Yeah. Okay, have a little, little taste. Don't break your teeth. 
And you like it. Like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It can be very boring after a while, though, if you have to have this every day. Yeah, exactly. There was one thing that did make tack a little bit more exciting. When it came up from the hold, after you'd been at sea for a week or so, it would come a little bit more like this. Oh. Oh. They look like stag beetles, but baby stag beetles. They are weevils. They do look quite nice in a way. And weevils would get into all of the biscuits. They'd burrow into them and they'd eat into the biscuits. OK, everyone take a weevily biscuit. OK, and what you'd have to do... What you do to get the bugs out is you'd tap it on the table. If you were really desperate, then you'd eat the bugs as well. If you had the beer, you wouldn't really taste the food, so it wouldn't really matter. The problem with this diet was that it was prone to causing scurvy, a disease caused by a lack of vitamin C, where your gums rot and your teeth fall out. Sailors discovered that citric fruit, like lemons and limes, stopped scurvy, but they also ate this. In France, they call it choucroute, sauerkraut in, in Germany. What do you reckon, Cameron? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't taste nice. It just tastes disgusting. Too much vinegar. Sauerkraut is a type of pickled cabbage, which keeps for a long time, and it's a good source of vitamin C. Some people find the taste a challenge. Oh, it smells it's like... quite honky, isn't it? Oh, God. <laughs> it mm. Are you on the verge of being sick? Mm -hmm. You're out of my pirate boat, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> But that's what they had, and, and so you'd have to be stuck with this kind of diet if you were out there on the seas fighting as a pirate or, or part of the navy. OK, do you still fancy the glamorous life of being a pirate? No! Yeah. The sauerkraut looked disgusting, tasted disgusting, and basically was disgusting. The vinegar made my taste buds shiver. I liked it, but I couldn't survive on a boat for a year um, eating that. We're looking into the fighting food that warriors ate throughout the ages. So far, we've gorged like gladiators. We've dined like knights round a table. And had some yo-ho you as pirates. Next up, we discover what today's soldiers eat, and we look forward to see what astronauts will scoff down when they boldly go where no dinner has gone before. An army marches on its stomach, and when these guys go into battle, they're fueled by the latest in high-tech food. So come and join me in my bivouac, guys. Right, so we found out how armies and navies survive uh, in the past, throughout history. Now I'm going to show you how armies survive out in the wilds today, in modern armies. OK, so here I have everything required for a massive meal for each one of you. OK, grab your pack. Cheese omelette with vegetables. Cheese omelette with vegetables, that sounds really Spaghetti good. with meat sauce. Pot rice with vegetables. Spaghetti with meat sauce. Pot roast with vegetables. The need to feed troops on the front line has led to loads of discoveries about the right foods to eat and how to preserve them. This is the latest way to feed soldiers on the battlefield. Ration packs you don't even have to cook. What do you think about this idea of, of a whole meal in sort of big plastic and metal packets? I don't think it would taste that nice. It's probably quite a lot processed because you can't really get a pot roast in that size. <laughs> it looks weird because you wouldn't think there's spaghetti in there. And it's like space food. It's like, you know when you're about to make your bed? It's a bit like that because you've got loads of different bits to like stick together. Like this. <laughs> it's like assembling a meal. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's what cooking is, though, isn't it? It's taking all the, the ingredients and turning them into something edible when it might not have been edible before. Now, each of these packs contains a heating implement as well. What you need to find is the green bag. Now, what's in here are some little sachets of magnesium. And when you add water to magnesium, it reacts with it, so it oxidises it very, very quickly, and it heats it up to a very, very high temperature. Uh, tear off the top of the bag. OK, so the main pouch needs to go in this bag, next to the chemical bag. OK, now, you're going to pour in enough water to just go up to between those two lines there. OK? Into the top there. Is that enough? Yep, whoop! <laughs> A little bit over the top. 
The gastronauts don't look convinced, but the chemical reaction with the magnesium should be enough to boil the water and heat up the meal, which is just as well, as frankly we're getting very wet and very hungry. You fold the top over, on top of the MRE. Oh, that's amazing. Put it on the side there. This is boiling water. That's already boiling in there. OK, let's get everyone started. That's already steaming there as well. Mm. So that's the magnesium in there, oxidising really, really quickly and creating a huge amount of heat. Now, you leave them here, and as that heats up and all the water heats up, it sits next to your pack of food and it just, it just makes it hot by being in contact with it. OK, these should be ready now, if we're lucky. So, everyone grab your pack from the top. When you've taken it out, squeeze it around to squish it all together to try and get the warmth to be spread evenly throughout the whole packet. So, squeeze it around, squish it, squish it around with your fingers. I think I'm squishing the meatballs. <laughs> <laughs> the way that they tend to eat these out in the field is straight from the bag. That looks quite exciting. Mm -hmm. A bit strange Can as I well. see? Oh, wow. It's like a meat bully sort of mixture, a cold meat bully one. Um, it's quite nice though. Mine doesn't really taste of anything. It's like a vegetable stir fry with stringy bits of meat in it. But nice? Oh, lovely. Now, what I really want to know about is this bizarre looking thing here. It's disgusting. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Just I'm not gonna absolutely lie. disgusting. It's all foamy and it tastes disgusting. It's not like normal omelette. I found out that. I have squished the meatballs. <laughs> it's quite amazing to see all these foods that have been developed for armies kind of finding their way into normal life, into, into foods that we eat. All of these things like canning and sterilising and things like that, they, they seem quite artificial, but they are ways of preserving food to keep them on the shelves for longer, to give us better nutrition, to, to, to make foods a little bit cheaper. And, and so all this stuff is finding its way into our lives. Some of it's good, some of it's bad, but at least it's, it's, it's pushing things forward. It's making us understand more about food and about what keeps people healthy and, and fighting fit. In the Middle Ages, a much wider range of animals were eaten than today, including bears, swan, and even roast hedgehog. The nursery rhyme Sing a Song of Sixpence may actually refer to a pie which blackbirds flew out of when the pastry was cut. But a recipe for rook pie was also popular, a rook being a crow-like black bird that is apparently rather tasty when baked in a pie. <laughs> We're going from present-day food to looking into the future. Just what will food be like when we have to eat it in space? OK, so we've explored the food of the modern-day soldier, and now I thought we'd look to the future. And what's the future? Space. Space, space exactly. So what do you think an astronaut eats in space? Would they eat foods that wouldn't go off quickly? Yeah. Um, I thought they might eat maybe some fruit. Fruit? Some sort of fruit, like dried up fruit. That's very clever. They do eat a lot of fruit. They don't have any fridges, so they can't keep food for a long time, but they can have dried fruit. They do have cookers for heating up ingredients, but all the food has to be completely preserved so that it won't go off up in space. Also, water is recycled. All the water, all the moisture in the air, urine, the whole works. It's all recycled so that they can use it again. It's quite strange, isn't it? Now, they have special foods, and what they do is they dry foods out. And this is the type of thing that they eat. This is real astronaut food that's been developed by NASA for use on the Space Shuttle. Crumbs can be deadly in space as they can float into the controls and damage equipment. So foods are specially freeze-dried to be light, to last a long time, and produce very few crumbs. What do you think about that? We just, just play with it in your head. What, what strikes you about that? It's light. It's really Very light. light. But it being light is the most important thing, because every pound of weight takes up a lot of fuel to get up there, so it's really important to keep everything really light. Well, my space shuttle is currently in for repair, so we can't use that. Instead, we're going to use a tool that NASA developed to try and recreate the experience of weightlessness, OK? Mm. Welcome to the gyroscope. Oh. 
gyroscopes were developed to train astronauts by simulating the zero gravity of space. Before they can eat like an astronaut, the gastronauts are going to have to find out what it's like to be weightless. So who wants to go first? Maya, let's go. So, have you been into space before? No. No? Spin the gastronaut! A lack of gravity can make you feel sick because the food floats around in your stomach and the fluids in your body rise to your head. So it's a bit like eating with a heavy cold. How does it feel? It felt like you had no gravity in the tour and you were just moving around and, and then it came out the chair. <laughs> Excellent. Well, your prize for that is to try some astronaut ice cream. It's a bit like a meringue sort of thing. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And it tastes quite nice, actually, and it's a bit foamy. You still fancy the idea of being an astronaut? Yeah. Excellent. OK, who's next? Here he goes. Now he knows what it's like to be weightless, what will Kanye think of eating like an astronaut? How was that? Cool. You feeling a little bit dizzy? <laughs> Ice cream sandwich. I really is like a meringue. Can I have another go? <laughs> <laughs> You know, in space, nobody can hear you scream. This whole experience was amazing, being a gastronaut. Um, my friends would never believe that I've done it. <laughs> well done. OK, here is your astronaut ice cream sandwich. Mm. I think what you should try is a stick of peanut butter. Oh. How does that look? Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, how would you feel if you had to survive on this kind of food up in the space station for a year? I feel a bit sick. Mm. I like it. And vomit in space is not a good thing, is it? I'd hardly survive eating a quarter of it than eating one whole. It's tough, isn't it? What's amazing is that this is high-tech food. This is, this is as far as food technology has ever gone. So, we've come from gladiators to astronauts. And what's amazing is that all of these foods that have been developed for people who have to be fighting fit all the time have found their way into our lives as well. And I think that's quite amazing. It's slightly vomit-inducing. are wee wee weeing all the way to CBBC. That doesn't sound very sanitary. It's Stinky and, and Turkey. Pinky, Pinky and Perky are trotting onto your screens with their brand new star-studded show. That's wrong. It's Peckham. <laughs> you know who I am? Why have you lost your memory? The Pinky and Perky show starts Monday at 5:45 on the CBBC channel. What is it with you pigs today? <laughs> Thanks for the tea lights, uh, Shirley. Thanks a lot. Oh, hello. Welcome back to CBBC with me, Holly and uh, Dunstan there. So we've had a really weird day. We found out that the thing behind all these orangey people is, in fact, a were-pumpkin. Would you believe it? It's kind of like a werewolf, but it's a pumpkin version. Every Halloween, they come out and they bite people and turn them orange. So at least we've got to the bottom of that. But Sarah Jane reckons the way to keep them away is to put out loads of tea lights. So I've got some more here. Da, 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 da. <gasps> Whoa, 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 whoa! Dunstan! Dunstan, wake up! Whoa, wake whoa, 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 did I black out again? I think you might have done, but what's going on here? You seem to have trashed all the tea lights. Is this you? I just don't know. What have you done? You know, this mystery is getting th deeper and deeper. There's only one thing for it. I'm going to have to reopen Harley Walsh Investigations! <laughs> I'm going to have to do some questioning, Dunstan, because I'm sorry to say this. You are the prime suspect now for who is the actual wear pumpkin. What? Right, so I'm going to put on my moustache. This is a big moustache, because this is going to need some big questions answered. But I haven't done anything. I'm sorry, Dunstan, I'm going to have to...